Good morning, QCon. Woo! Come on. Yeah, that's better. Um, yeah. Uh, so welcome to the Bare Knuckles performance track and uh, to, to my talk about high resolution performance telemetry at scale. First, a little bit about me. Um, start my timer there. Me, I'm Brian. Um, I work at Twitter. Uh, I'm a staff site reliability engineer. I've been at Twitter for over five years now. Uh, I work on a team called IOP, which is infrastructure optimization and performance. Um, my background is on telemetry, performance tuning, benchmarking, that kind of stuff. Um, I really like nerding out about uh, making things go faster. Um, I'm also heavily involved in our open source program at Twitter. Um, I have two open source projects currently, um, hopefully more in the future. Uh, but I also work on our, our process of helping uh, engineers actually publish open source software at Twitter. So what are we going to talk about today? Obviously, high resolution performance telemetry, but specifically, we're going to talk about uh, various sources of telemetry, sampling resolution, and sort of the issues that come along with it. We're going to talk about how to achieve low cost and high resolution at the same time, and some of the practical benefits that we've seen um, at Twitter from having high resolution telemetry. So let's begin by talking about various telemetry sources. But what do we even mean by telemetry? Well, telemetry is the process of recording and transmitting readings of an instrument. With systems performance telemetry, we look to add instrumentation that helps us to quantify runtime characteristics of our workload and the amount of resource that it takes to execute. Essentially, we're trying to quantify what our systems are doing and how well they are doing it. By understanding these aspects of performance, we're then able to optimize for increased performance and efficiency. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So what do we want to know when we're talking about systems performance? In Brendan Gregg's systems performance book, uh, he talks about the use method. Essentially, the use method uh, is used to quickly identify resource bottlenecks or errors. Use focuses on the closely related concepts of utilization and saturation, and also errors. Um, when we're talking about utilization and saturation, they're, they're sort of uh, different sides of the same coin. Um, utilization directly correlates to making the most use of the amount of resource that our infrastructure has. Um, we actually want to maximize this. Um, within the constraint of saturation, though. Once we've hit saturation, we've hit a bottleneck in the system, and our system's going to start to have degraded performance as load increases. Um, so we want to try and avoid that, because that leads to bad user experience. Um, errors is maybe somewhat self-explanatory, but things like packet drops, retransmits, and other errors can have a huge impact on distributed systems. So we want to be able to quantify those as well. Beyond use, we begin to look at things like efficiency. Um, this is a measure of how well our workload is running on a given um, platform or, or resource. Um, we can think of efficiency in probably a variety of ways. Um, it might be the amount of QPS per dollar that we're getting, or we might be trying to optimize a target like power efficiency, um, so trying to get the most workload for the least amount of power expense. Um, the other way to look at efficiency is how well we're utilizing a specific hardware resource. So we might look at things like our um, CPU cache hit rate, our branch predictor performance, et cetera. Um, Another really important aspect of systems performance, particularly in you know distributed microservice architecture stuff, is latency, though, um, which is how long it takes to uh, perform a given operation. 
So there are a bunch of traditional uh, telemetry sources that um, are, are generally exposed through command line tools uh, and common monitoring agents. Um, these help us to essentially get a high level understanding of utilization, saturation, and errors. Um, you can, uh, things like top, like the basic sort of stuff that you would uh, start to look at when you're looking at uh, systems performance. Uh, Brendan actually has a really good rundown of like uh, systems performance diagnostics in 60 seconds or something like that. Um, so these are the types of things that you might use uh, for that. Uh, so you're looking at you know things like the CPU time running, uh, which can tell us both utilization and saturation, because uh, we know that the CPU can only run for the amount of nanoseconds within that second for that number of cores that you have. Um, we also know that disks have a maximum bandwidth and a maximum number of IOPS that they're able to perform. Uh, and network also has um, sort of limits there. Network is sort of where it becomes obvious uh, when there are errors, because you have these nice little like protocol statistics um, and packets dropped and all, all sorts of wonderful things. Um, so these are sort of the traditional things um, that a lot of uh, telemetry agents expose. Um, the next evolution is starting to understand more about the actual hardware behaviors. Um, we can do this by using performance counters, um, which allow us to instrument the CPU and some of the software behaviors. Um, performance events um, help us measure really granular things, like we can actually count the number of cycles uh, that the CPU has run. Uh, we can count the number of instructions retired. We can count the number of cache accesses at all these different cache levels within, within the uh, CPU. Um, this telemetry is more typically exposed by profiling tools, um, things like uh, Intel VTune and uh, the Linux tool Perf. Um, However, some telemetry agents actually do start to expose metrics from these performance counters. Um, and they become really interesting for starting to look at how the workload is, is running on the hardware. And you can start to identify um, areas where tuning uh, might <coughs> make a difference. Like you might realize that you have a bunch of cache misses um, and that by changing your code a little bit, you can start to actually improve your code's performance dramatically. Um, yeah. Uh, so performance events for efficiency, uh, we can start to look at things like um, power. We can look at cycles per instruction, um, which is how many clock cycles it actually takes for each assembly instruction to execute. Um, uh, CPI actually is a, is a pretty common uh, metric to start to look at how well your workload is running on a CPU. Um, you can look at, as I, as I said, like cache hit rates. You can also look at how well the branch predictor uh, is performing in the CPU. Um, modern CPUs are like crazy complicated. Um, and they do all sorts of really interesting stuff behind the scenes to sort of make your code run fast. Um, on modern hyperscaler processors, uh, we should actually expect less than one uh, cycle per instruction, because they're able to retire multiple instructions in parallel, um, even on the same core. Um, but kind of in reality, that's rare to see on anything but like a very compute uh, heavy workload. Um, anytime you're accessing things like memory, it's, it's more likely that you're going to see multiple cycles per instruction as the CPU winds up essentially waiting for that data to come in. Um, and then we have eBPF, which is really cool and it gives us superpowers. Um, it's arguably one of the most powerful tools that we have for understanding systems performance. Um, and really, I think a lot of us are just starting to really tap into it um, to help get uh, better telemetry. eBPF is the Enhanced Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, 
as you might guess, uh, it sort of evolved from tooling to filter packets, um, but it's turned into a very powerful tracing tool. It gives us the ability to uh, trace things that are occurring both in kernel space and user space, um, and actually executes custom code in the kernel uh, to provide uh, summaries, um, which we can then pull into user space. Um, while traditional uh, sources can measure like the total number of packets transferred or total bytes, um, with eBPF we can actually start to do things like get histograms of our packet size distribution, um, and that's really, really exciting. Um, Similarly, we're able to get things like block I.O. size distribution, um, block device latencies, all sorts of like really, really cool stuff um, that help us understand um, down, to, down to actual individual events, right? We're doing actual tracing uh, with eBPF, um, and it gives us a really interesting view about how our systems are performing. Uh, so, eBPF, very powerful for understanding latency. We can start to understand uh, how long uh, runnable tasks are waiting in the run queue um, before they get scheduled to run on a CPU. Uh, we can actual, actually measure the distribution of file system uh, operation latencies, like read, write, uh, open, fsync, all that stuff. Um, we can measure how long individual requests are waiting, waiting on the block device queue. Um, and that helps us to evaluate how different queuing algorithms actually um, wind up performing for our workload. Um, we can also measure things like outbound network connect latencies, the, the delta in time between SYN and getting a SYN act back. Um, so all very, very cool stuff. Um, eBPF is also insanely powerful for workload characterization, which is sort of an often neglected aspect of systems performance telemetry. Um, it becomes very difficult to work with a vendor if they pose the question of like, oh, you know, what are your, you know, block IO sizes? And you're just like, uh, I, I don't know, it just, it's this type of workload, I guess. Um, you actually need to be able to give them numbers so they can help you. Um, with eBPF, you can start to get uh, things like the block I.O. size distribution for, for read and write operations. Um, so now you can actually be like, hey, uh, you know, it's not, it's not 4K. Um, it's actually, you know, this size. Um, and you can give them the full distribution, and that really starts to help things. Um, you can also look at your packet size distribution. Um, so you can understand, you know, actually if you're, you know, approaching full MTU packets or, you know, if jumbo frames would help or, you know, if you're just sending a lot of very small packets. Um, a lot of my background is from optimizing uh, cache services like uh, memcache and Redis type stuff um, where we have very small packet sizes generally. Um, and yeah, it, it can be interesting that you can start to hit actual packet rate limits within uh, the kernel uh, way before you hit actual bandwidth saturation. So one of the most critical aspects about measuring systems performance is how you're sampling it and how often you're sampling it. Um, it all comes down to sampling resolution. The Nyquist-Shannon theorem um, basically states that when we're sampling a uh, signal, uh, there's an inherent bandwidth limit or a, a filter that's uh, defined by our sampling rate. This imposes an upper bound on the highest frequency component that we can capture in our measured signal. More practically, if we want to capture bursts that are happening, we need to sample at least twice within the duration of the shortest burst we wish to capture. Um, when we're talking about like, you know, web scale distributed systems type things, um, you know, 200 milliseconds is a very, very long time actually. Um, a lot of users will not think your site is responsive if it takes more than 200 milliseconds. Um, 
when we're talking about things like caches, um, 50 milliseconds is a very long time. So you start to get into this interesting problem where now things that take a very long time on a computer scale are actually very short on a human scale. Um, and so you actually need to sample very, very frequently. Otherwise, you're going to kind of just miss these things that are happening. In order to demonstrate the effect that a uh, sampling rate has on telemetry, we're going to take a look at uh, CPU utilization on a random machine I sampled for an hour. Um, there it is. Um, this is uh, sampled on a minutely basis and uh, is just the CPU utilization. The actual scale doesn't matter for the purpose of our talk here. Um, but we can tell from this that, hey, you know, our utilization is relatively constant. Uh, at the end, there's like this brief period where it's, you know, a little bit higher and then comes back down to normal. But I would say that, the, you know, other than that, it's pretty even. Well, that's not actually how it is. Um, here we're seeing uh, secondly data um, in the blue. Uh, with the minutely data in the red, and we now see a much different picture. We can now see that there are regular spikes and dips below this minutely average that we are otherwise capturing. Um, time series is also a lot fuzzier, just sort of in general, and arguably a lot harder to read. Like, I wouldn't want to look at this from, like, thousands of servers at that sort of resolution. It just becomes too much, too much cognitive burden for me as a human. Um, and here we're actually looking at a histogram distribution of those values um, normalized into uh, utilization nanoseconds per second sort of thing. Um, so they're comparable. Um, but really, the most interesting thing is about the the skew of these distributions. The um, minutely gives you sort of this false impression that it's all basically the same. Um, and the reason why the chart looks very, very boring to the right-hand side is because that secondly data has a very, very long tail off to the right that just doesn't show with this particular scaling. Uh, log scale might have been better here. But um, the secondly data also has more of a, even though it's, it's right skewed, it's more of you know, a, a normal distribution, whereas the, uh, the minutely data is kind of weird looking. Um, So this problem isn't restricted to just sampling gauges and counters. Um, it can also appear in things like latency histograms. Um, RPC Perf, which is my cache benchmarking tool, has the ability to generate these waterfall uh, plots. Uh, essentially, you have time running downwards and uh, increased latency to the right-hand side of the chart. Um, and the color intensity kind of sweeps from black through all the shades of blue and then from blue all the way to red um, to indicate the number of events that fell into that latency bucket. Um, so here we're looking at some synthetic testing uh, with RPC Perf against a cache instance. Um, in this particular case, uh, when I was looking at minutely data, my P39 and P49 was uh, higher than I really expected it to be. Um, and when I took a look at this latency waterfall, you can see that there are these periodic spikes of higher latency that are actually skewing my uh, minutely tail latencies. Um, and to me, this indicated that there was something we needed to dig in and, and see what was going on. Like, it's pretty obvious that these things are occurring on a minutely basis and always at the same offset in a minute. Um, and these types of anomalies or deviations in performance can actually have like a very huge impact on your systems. Um, so how can we capture bursts? Oh, we just increase our sampling resolution, right? Um, 
But this comes at a cost. Um, you have the overhead of just collecting the data, and that's pretty hard to mitigate. Um, but then you also need to store it and analyze it. Um, and these are areas where I think we can improve. So how can we get the best of both worlds, right? We want to be able to capture these very short bursts, which necessitate a very high sampling rate. Um, but we don't want to pay for it. Um, we need to think about what we're really trying to achieve in our telemetry. We need to sort of go back to the beginning and think about what we're trying to capture and what we're trying to measure. Um, we want to capture these bursts. Um, and we know that reporting uh, percentiles for latency distributions is a pretty common way of being able to understand what's happening at rates of thousands, millions you know, of events per second, like very many. So let's see what we might be able to do by using uh, distributions to help us understand our data. So instead of a minutely average uh, as the red line here, we actually have a, a P50 or the 50th percentile um, across each of these minutes. Um, so this tells us that half the time within the minute, the utilization is this red line value or less, um, but also that it's higher than this uh, the other half of the time. Uh, it actually looks pretty similar to the minutely average, uh, just because of how this data is distributed within each minute. Um, if we shift that up to the 90th percentile, we're now capturing everything except those spikes. Um, this could be a much better um, time series to look at if we're trying to uh, do something like capacity planning, um, particularly when you're looking at like um, network link utilization, um, you might have a target that like, you know, you want, I don't know, 80% 80, 80 utilization is, is your target for the network so you can like actually handle bursts that are happening. Um, so looking at like the P90 of, you know, a, a higher resolution time series might, might give you a better idea of what you're actually using um, while still allowing for some bursts that are happening outside of that. Uh, and here we've abandoned our second lead data entirely, um, but we're reporting out multiple percentiles. We have the min, the uh, P10, 50, 90, and the max. Um, and we can really get a sense of how um, the CPU utilization looked within each minute. Um, you can tell that we still have this like period of increased CPU utilization at the end. Um, but now we're actually capturing these spikes, right? Um, our max is now reflecting sort of uh, the, those peaks in utilization. Um, but we can also tell that generally it's a lot lower than that, right? The, the distance between the max and the P90 is actually pretty intense. So we can actually start telling that like, hey, our workload is spiky just based on the ratio between these two time series. Um, Particularly bursty workloads might be an indicator that there's something to go in and look at, um, and areas where like you could you could benefit from from performance analysis and tuning. Um, the other really cool thing about this is that instead of needing 60 times the amount of data to get secondly instead of minutely, now we only need five times the amount of data to be stored and aggregated. Um, and we have still a pretty good indicator of what the subminutely behaviors are. Also, this is a lot easier to look at as a person. Um, I can kind of look at this and make sense of it. The fuzzy uh, secondly time series is, is very, very hard, especially with you know thousands of computers. Um, so to me, this winds up being a, a very interesting tool for, for understanding our distribution without um, burning your eyes out looking at charts. So how can we make use of this? Um, we want to be able to sample at a high resolution, and we want to be able to produce these histograms of what the data looks like within a given uh, 
window, essentially. Um, so you're doing sort of like a, a moving histogram across time, um, shoving your values in there, and then uh, exporting these these summaries about uh, what the percentiles look like, what the distribution of your data looks like. Um, so this leads me to Resilis. So I had to write a tool to do this. Um, uh, Resolus, Resolus does um, high resolution sampling of our underlying sources. Uh, there's a uh, metrics library that's shared between Resolus and my benchmarking tool, RPCPerf. Um, and it's able to produce these, these summaries uh, based on data that's inserted into it. Um, Resolus gives us the ability to sample from all those uh, sources that we talked about um, earlier, our traditional counters about you know CPU utilization, disk bandwidth, stuff like that. Um, it can also sample uh, performance counters, um, which gives us the ability to start to look at how efficiently our code is running on our uh, compute platform. And it has eBPF support, which is very cool for being able to um, look at our workload and latency of these very granular events. Um, Resolus is able to produce um, insightful metrics, even if we're only externally aggregating on a minutely basis. We get those hints about what our sub-minutely um, data distribution looks like. Um, the eBPF support has been very cool for uh, helping us to actually measure what our workloads look like and um, be able to capture the uh, performance characteristics. Um, these types of things would be unavailable to us otherwise. There's, there's just no way to do it except to trace these things. Um, eBPF is also very low overhead just because it's, it's running in the kernel. Um, and then you're just pulling the, the summary data over. Um, so it winds up being fairly cheap to instrument these things that are happening all the time. Um, so we're able to measure like our scheduler latency, uh, what our packet size distribution is, our block IO size distribution, very, very important stuff when you're talking to a hardware vendor to you know try to optimize um, your workload on a given platform, or the platform for the hardware. Um, Resolus is open source, yay! Um, it's available on GitHub. Uh, issues and pull requests are welcome. Um, I think that it's been able to uh, provide us a lot of interesting insight into how our systems are running. Um, it's helped us to capture some bursts that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, and I think it's useful even for smaller environments, right? Um, a lot, a lot of times at small. Uh, so I've worked in small shops before I worked at Twitter, um, and I really wish I had a tool like this before. Um, at small shops, like often you don't have the time to go write something like this, so it's really great that uh, Twitter allowed me to open source something like this so it can sort of become a community thing. Um, and oftentimes at smaller shops, like your performance actually matters a lot because you don't necessarily have a huge budget to just throw money at the problem. Um, so understanding how your system is performing um, and being able to diagnose runtime performance issues is actually very critical. Um, at Twitter scale, um, even just like a percent is a very large number of dollars. Um, so we want to be able to, to squeeze the most out of our systems. So in practice, how has Resolus helped us? Um, going back to this, this terrible, terrible latency waterfall. Um, so we actually saw something like this in production. Um, we were seeing these peaks in, uh, actually we measured it as uh, CPU utilization when we were looking at it in production. Um, and periodically the CPU utilization of the cache instances was, was bursting. Um, 
Resolus, in addition to providing this uh, histogram distribution sort of thing, also looks for the peak within each rolling interval and will report out the offset from the top of the second that the peak occurred. Um, and that can be very useful to start correlating with your logs and your other like tracing data within, within your environment um, and help to really sort of narrow down what you're looking at. Um, so Resolus was able to uh, identify this peak in CPU utilization, um, which was twice the baseline, uh, twice what the baseline was, uh, and it had a fixed offset in the minute. Um, we narrowed it down to a background task that was running um, and causing causing this sort of impact. Um, and uh, for the particular case of cache, we were able to um, just eliminate this background task, um, and that made our latency go back down to normal. Uh, Resolus has also helped us detect CPU saturation that happened on a sub-minutely basis. Um, so this is something where if you have minutely data, you're just not going to see this at all because it winds up getting smoothed out by this um, sort of low-pass filter that the nyquist Shannon theorem talks about. Um, uh, and uh, Resolus was able to detect this in production and capture and reflect the CPU saturation uh, that was happening. Um, and that helped the backend team actually go in and identify that, oh, hey, yeah, you know, our, our upstream is sending us this, you know, burst of traffic at that period of time. And they were able to work with the, the upstream service to smooth that out and have it not be so spiky. So in summary, um, there are many, many sources of telemetry um, to understand our system's performance. Sampling resolution is very important. Otherwise, you're going to miss these small things that actually do matter. Uh, In-process summarization can reduce your cost of aggregation and storage, um, you know, instead of taking you know, 60 times the amount of data to store a secondly time series, uh, you can just export like maybe five percentiles. Um, you can actually even start, the savings becomes even more apparent when you're sampling at even higher rates. Like you might want to sample every you know, 100 millisecond or 10 times per second or something like that. Um, you might want to sample even faster than that for certain things. Um, Really, it all goes back to what is the smallest thing I want to be able to capture. And as you start multiplying how much data you need within a second, um, the, the savings just becomes even more. And having high resolution telemetry can help us diagnose runtime performance issues as well as uh, steer optimization and performance tuning efforts. And Resolus has helped us at Twitter to address these needs. Um, and it's, again, available on GitHub. And now I have some time for Q&A. Uh, there is a mic on a stand here in the center. And on each end by the projector tables, there are mics. Uh, so if anyone has questions, please, uh, please ask. Hello, are you able to hear me? Uh, okay, so my question is, uh, you mentioned this uh, uh, sub-second uh, uh, sampling. So what are the tools you use to sample, say, CPU utilization in microseconds or mm. uh, disk usage in microseconds? So what are those uh, basic tools that you are using? Uh, so those those basic um, or, or traditional telemetry sources are exposed by ProcFS and Sisyphus. Um, so you're able to just kind of open open those files and, and read out of them uh, periodically. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so ProcFS, uh, okay. I um, But then you need root access maybe or is something that any person can... 
Uh, so that kind of stuff actually does not need uh, root okay. access. When you start looking at things like uh, perf events, um, you do need uh, uh, sysadmin privileges, essentially. Mm -hmm. You do need root access um, okay. or for the task, uh, for the, the mm -hmm. binary to have uh, cap sysadmin would be the, uh, the okay. capability. Um, and eBPF also requires um, higher level access because you're injecting code into the mm -hmm. kernel. Um, and actually, there's something in, uh, I forget what recent kernel version, but they're starting to lock down things like that. And uh, by default, uh, they're still, it, it seems like they're still trying to work out how to deal with that exactly. OK, uh, another question. Um, is like how uh, how uh, you do it? Uh, like I don't think on production you can do it, right? You have to come up with a system that is very similar to production, and where you run these tests to make sure that, or are you running on the production itself? Uh, we run Resolus on our production fleet. Okay. Um, having having the tooling, so we're able to rapidly um, identify. Uh, runtime performance issues mm -hmm. and uh, give teams insights to help diagnose those issues and root cause them and mm -hmm. resolve them uh, is definitely worthwhile. Um, mm -hmm. Resolus winds up being not not super expensive to to run. Actually, um, I'm trying to think of it takes about five percent of a single core and maybe 50 megabytes of resident memory to okay. sample at, I believe that's for 10 times per second with all the default samplers, so none of the eBPF functionality, but all of the perf and all of the uh, traditional systems performance telemetry mm -hmm. in what I, I think is, is a very small footprint. Um, and definitely the uh, insight is worth whatever cost that has to us. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, come up and ask. <laughs> uh, in your example, does the Resolus uh, uh, record the diagnostics once you spot some, something is uh, abnormal uh, in terms of uh, statistics. And if you, it does, um, what's the footprint of, mm. looks like and the cost of it? So that's a, that's a very interesting question um, about whether uh, Resolus uh, records um, as, it, as it detects anomalies. Um, and that's something that uh, we've been talking about internally uh, and I think would be a very cool feature to add. Um, one could imagine um, Resolus being able to use that sort of like metrics library to easily detect that something abnormal is happening and either increase its sampling resolution or dump a trace out. Um, Resolus winds up in a very interesting position um, in terms of observability and telemetry and stuff like that um, where it could pretty easily have like an on-disk uh, buffer of, of this telemetry available at very high resolution. Um, this hasn't been implemented yet, but is definitely a direction that I want to be able to take the project in. Um, yeah, so great question. OK. Um, yeah, so is it possible to extend Resolus to um, provide telemetry on business KPIs as opposed to just systems KPIs? Um, the answer is yes. Um, so Resolus also has this mode um, that we use on some of our uh, production caches. Um, so the memcache compatible servers. Uh, so we use twemcache at Twitter, um, which is our fork. Um, exposes a, a there's a, a stats thing built into the protocol. Um, and Resolus can actually sort of sit in between and sample 
at higher resolution um, the underlying stats source and then expose these percentiles about that. Um, so we actually use that on some of our, our larger production caches to help us capture um, peaks in QPS and what the offset is into the minute uh, or, yeah. Uh, so yeah, one could imagine extending that to capture data from any sort of uh, standard metrics exposition endpoint um, and ingest that into uh, Resolus and then expose those those percentiles. Um, so there would be probably some development work needed. That would actually be. I would call that almost trivial. Um, if one were familiar with the code base, it would definitely be trivial. Um, but yeah, there's already sort of a little bit of that, that framework in there just from being able to ingest stats from, from TwemCache, but it would need to be extended to pull from you know, HTTP and parse JSON or something like that, you know, whatever the, the metrics exposition format is. Um, this is actually another thing that we've been uh, talking about internally um, because Twitter uses um, Finagle for a lot of things and our kind of standard stack exposes metrics via an HTTP endpoint um, and the ability to sort of sit in between our traditional collector and the application and provide this sort of increased insight into things um, without that high uh, cost of aggregating. Um, is very interesting to us. Um, so that, I think, is work that is likely to happen, although I, there, are, there are some competing priorities right now. But uh, yeah, uh, if, if that, that would be the, the kind of stuff that I would uh, definitely welcome a pull request on. Mm. Do, you, do you consider that low enough that you make sure you run it all the time on all cloud servers? Do you prefer to have a sort of sample set of servers? And, or, you know, mm. would, would it have, would either of those approaches have an impact on the sort of data volume of downstream metrics and collection? What, what's your approach to, you know, what's your interaction and when do you run So the, the question was about the uh, resource footprint of Resolus and sort of the, the trade-off between uh, running it all the time and, and getting that telemetry uh, from production systems versus sort of the cost and, you know, do we do sampling or run it everywhere all the time. Um, my goal uh, with the footprint that it has is that it could be run everywhere all the time in production. Um, I think that um, we, we, we always have, you know, telemetry agents running, right? Um, and I think that uh, Resolus can actually take over a lot of what our current uh, agent is doing uh, and fit within that footprint and still give us this increased uh, resolution. Um, and yeah, I trying to think of what the what the current percentage of rollout is. Um, but the, the goal is to run it everywhere all the time. Um, in some sort of resource constrained uh, areas, um, so if you think about like containerization environments where you have, um, uh, you know, basically like a, a small system slice dedicated that isn't isn't running containers. Um, that's where things become a little more resource constrained. But again, I, I believe that uh, Resolus can help take away some of that um, work that's being done and we'll be able to actually um, get rid of existing agents. Um, things like, you know, the, the resource footprint of things like, you know, Python telemetry agents and stuff like that uh, it just gets really unpredictable. Uh, Resolus is uh, in in Rust, um, 
So the, the memory footprint's actually very, very easy to predict. Um, the CPU utilization is pretty constant, doesn't have any you know, GC overheads or stuff like that. So I think that we'll be able to shift um, where we're spending resource and be able to run ResList everywhere all the time. Um, I think that we will be looking into things like uh, dynamically increasing the uh, sampling resolution, having an on-disk buffer, being able to capture uh, tracing information, possibly integrated into our distributed tracing tool, Zipkin, stuff like that, and be able to start tying all these pieces together. Um, but yeah, everywhere all the time. Is this on? Yeah, it is on, OK. Um, can you go into <clears throat> A little more detail about, okay, you use ResList, you find a spike in performance, and then how do we magically map that back to what's going on, what application's causing the performance? <clears throat> yeah. Um, that is where things become more art than science. Um, so typically, I've had to go in and... Um, a trace on the individual system and, and really look to understand what's causing that. Um, we, we can look at things like, you know, which container is using the resource at that point of time. Um, but I think at, at some point you wind up falling back onto um, other, other tools while, while you're doing root cause analysis. Um, and those might be things like getting a perf uh, record data. Uh, that might be things like looking at your application logs and just kind of seeing what sort of requests were coming in um, at that point in time or doing a, a, a more analysis of the log file. Cool. Well. Thank you all for coming to the talk, and you'll find me floating around and can always come up and ask me questions later, too. Thank you.